You're listening to another episode of Battles with Bits of Rubber. Check this new toy I got. Ooh, what is that? Oh my god. <laughs> Is that a vaping device? No, it's a remote control smoke smoke uh, thing. That's awesome. That's very cool. Yeah. So you can just pull that out on cue and just let the yeah. Smoke so out. you can put it in costumes and you know if somebody's doing a burn makeup that you know pull a smoldering body out of nice. out of a fire, you can dress this on them someplace. Oh, cool! I like that. So yeah, I got my Jack yeah. Daniels. Can you? Can you hear nice. The, the Cheers. Key? clinky of the ice. It's a Sunday. I should probably be drinking by now, too. Mm. Oh, that's the good stuff. Well, I'm plum tuckered out because I'm... Well, it's been warm here. Yeah, here too. And I started my day with my uh, my 50-mile walk. I had some interesting right. uh, emails from a few people um, that were doing some stuff, and it's really... It's a weird sensation. When I get a question, and I really want to get deep into the answer... I almost sort of fall over myself to try and get it, you know, type it out. And I started using the um, the speech to text feature a lot more. And sometimes when yeah. people have been responding, I just send voice notes because it's quicker than typing sometimes. But I have the Dragon Naturally Speaking installed on here, and it's I haven't used it much, um, but it I think you have to train it. It's to, really good to really work well. It is really good. I mean, the the the, the Google Docs has one. Which is okay. I would say the um, the dragon, actually speaking, because it, it's not cheap, but it's good. But it's they don't have like a a phone app that's part of the thing. Like it's an yeah. extra thing. And it's like well, you already paid like two, three hundred quid or whatever it was for the software. It should come with a bloody app as well. But but yeah, yeah you would think you would think. But no, that and as much as good. it was, I you know I've had it for a while and I've. God, I can count on the fingers of one hand how many times I've used it since I installed exactly it. Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think the thing to do actually is to is to record with the um, the, the either the voice note or with Dragon. I, I think just close your eyes, don't look at the screen, and just say what you want to say as honest you can as you can, and then basically pick the bones out of it later. Uh, I think that's, the that's way a good to do idea it. Be because if you and I think that's quite useful when writing a piece is to write at the top a very pithy cut down as 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 bare bones as you can accurate like you might say I think this is stupid and here's why or whatever so you just literally write that at the top of the page and have that you know as a header on every page to keep you on points so you know what it is you're going on about otherwise you can kind of detach and I think that's what <laughs> that's what yeah you know I get to that point where you go what was I talking about? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a bit like this. I'm like, where? <laughs> so what you said you were working on floors in the house? You were Yeah, well basically you were redoing some floors? Yeah, I mean the house the house was refurbished, I think, in the seventies. And so they've done this job with the floor. And it's basically like the floors in this country now, because of fire regulations, it used to be they were floor boards. So you get like six or mm -hmm. eight inch wide boards that you know, they were pine boards and um, that's how floorboards always used to be. Um, but now when they do floors, they have to be uh, interlocking, you know, sheets. And they typically are sort of four feet long, uh, sorry, two feet wide and eight feet long boards that are cut. And so that's what's here. But they haven't been screwed into the into the joists. So they're kind of free flowing a bit. So when you yeah, walk they around, squeak? they squeak and they, you know, they make horrible noises. So... Um, I, I sort of took it, we, we've been thinking about it for a while, but I, I took it by myself to basically, because the upstairs is horrible, the carpet is disgusting. So we just cut a big section of carpet out just to see what the floor looked like and then ripped a few of them up and then steadied the joists. I noticed some of the some of the joists were going into, I don't know what you call them, but they're like the metal hangers that the joists go into. Right. And they were kind of, they weren't loose. I mean, they were they were securely in there, but you could wiggle them side to side. The joist holders were slightly too big. So I, I poured a load of biscuit foam around the outside of it so they couldn't wiggle in them. Yeah, uh, and that that's worked a really smart well. thing. And then I basically bought some um, insulation uh, fiberboard, stuff you put under hard flooring to stop your neighbors mm -hmm. below being annoyed. Uh, so I cut strips of that, put them on the joist, and then put the wood back on and then screwed it through you know, with, with wood screws. 
um, and made that nice and tight. So now the whole thing's like a unit. It's solid. It doesn't move, and uh, they don't squeak because of the you know the fiber acts as kind of like a fabric washer that's crushed down. It's one of the things on my to do list also because our, our house was built in 1978, and as ground settles and so on it yeah the floors have become more more squeaky since we've been here Mm -hmm. and it's getting to the point now where you can barely take a step anywhere upstairs without it sounding like the house is haunted (laughs) exactly (laughs) same deal with this and the kids you know they run around upstairs so was that so that was hard that was quite hard work and like i'm, I'm feeling yeah, it in my I can body imagine. because doing it by yourself well, I, too well i remember doing it when i was 25 in the first house that we had and i'm like i was just bouncing around doing you know long days and now i'm like oh my god i can feel every bit of this so i can definitely feel my body's age but this is on top of my 15 mile walk this morning so you know i think i'm doing too bad for an old fella yeah but uh, well, I, I did some transplanting on friday and my back is fucked just from carrying heavy just from carrying tons. heavy heavy bags of topsoil and and yeah but got everything got it all done so well, that's cool well it's Yay. good to have some physical graft it's nice the weather's good enough to be able to do that stuff yeah now it's yeah it's getting was where you'd get up in the morning and be 45 50 degrees and now it's easily 10 15 degrees warmer than that yeah at the same same time of the morning and i know it's going to get Get even warmer as the as the year progresses. Yeah, it, well, it's been it's toasty here. The last couple of weeks have been really warm, and it's going to be like it for another few days, I think. So I'll be making hay with the sun shines and I was out in the yeah. yard. Is your up. is you do you have do you have AC in your house? No, no, neither do we. No one in this country really has AC. So if you want cold air and lots of water there, obviously you've got to pay a fortune for it. Whereas us, you just open the window 99% of the year, you will get cold air and plenty of water coming in. So it's like, <laughs> that shit's for free outside most of the time. So that's why when people yeah. hear, well, you don't have AC. I'm like, yeah, you know, the temperature that you make it for $400 a month by turning it down to like 68 degrees. That's what it's like most of the time outside. So it doesn't need to be <laughs> what we spend a fortune on is heating the bloody house when it gets cold. Instead. My parents took me on a, on a driving Western vacation when I was eight years old. Uh, we drove out from Ohio and we visited Colorado and Arizona and Utah, you know, the whole, the whole West. And that's when I fell in love with, with the West. But, um, you know, when I was eight years old, air conditioning in a car was pretty brand new. Mm-hmm. And it certainly didn't come, you know, factory installed. It was an aftermarket thing. So my dad had air conditioning installed in the car. And I'm, I'm sure they would have gotten a divorce if we had done this vacation without AC. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a godsend. It really is, especially on long journeys. There's nothing like it. Especially you've got leather seats or something. Like, you yeah, know, and you stick to them. And it's, yeah, it's just unpleasant. Yeah. Sounds every time you move, it's like farting. <laughs> Well, that's my excuse anyway. <laughs> oh, so that was good. And then I've, I'm, tomorrow I've got some timber turning up for my sh- my doors. I think I told you about this whole debacle about my workshop doors. Uh, yeah. I paid a company. But they're going to look so cool when they're done. Oh, they'll be cool. But originally I was going to have them made. And I, I had paid a company to make me oak doors custom to this, you know, the aperture available to replace the, the knackered one they've got. And um, yeah, basically, I paid a bunch of money, and they fucked off and went under, taking my money with me. But they're they've done this a lot apparently. But we managed to get the money back through Visa. This was a couple of years ago now, but uh, it still means I don't have the bloody doors. So I don't trust anybody to do it. So I'm just going to make it myself. So last couple of days, I've yeah, built the um the the frame, and they've been made. And then when the the lumber turns up, I'm gonna um make the doors up and then fit those hopefully in a day. Well, I'll make them this week, and then I can fit them in a day when we've got a good day. Uh, after they're made hopefully this weather will hold out but i drew them up in yeah. fusion 360 so i took my measurements and drew them in th- fusion 360 and then it was just really fun to be able to take your measurements of where things are and i really love pleased. fusion 360 it's so handy to do stuff yeah it's really handy and i remember seeing years ago well about a year and a half ago when i was first looking at having these doors done uh, I saw somebody doing something in Google SketchUp. He was making the doors in. I was like, why the fuck would you use a CAD program for something you're not going to machine up? And of course, at the bottom, it shows you like all the separate parts that make up that drawing. And if you make a, you know, an overall width adjustment, every part automatically 
constraints to the same dimensions and then you basically have a cutting list at the bottom of all the parts and the angles so you know how much timber you need to order and what without making anything and i was like fuck that is amazing <laughs> and uh <laughs> it's it's so easy actually to do a door and a door frame because it's just a series of rectangles positioned together from from a from a right. CAD point of view it's a piece of piss and it's like god why would you do it any other way it's so quick um and yeah, and if you want to know how what the distance is diagonally between two things because you've made the door a half inch narrower because it you know you want to make change the shape, you just click and and it'll tell you and measure it and tell you and you're like oh my god this is, I mean it's so simple but at the same time it's incredibly it's new enough to excite me. Um, and one of the benefits of technology. Oh man, it's impressive. So so it's a com combining that and and that and I've been. 3D printing as well. Uh, I've been making some cores I showed you and, and, and making the, yeah. the, the, the It looked like the, the last one, the picture looked like you didn't have any of the, the corner lift. I had a little bit, on, on, a little bit, not on too two bad. Of the, two of the pieces looked pretty pretty good. Yeah, I, I, I've got some lifts, but nothing I can't sort out with filler. One of them I printed inverted. I ups, made it upside down. I rotated it 180. Yeah. Um, and that, that, that just meant the curvature happened at the bottom instead of the top. But... Um, <laughs> I've ordered some. Uh, I'm going to try some of the some of the uh, the hairspray stuff, and uh, yeah, I, I, I've I've tried everything I can. Um, it's just a case of I think the other ones that were really bad. I think. Have you gotten new filament yet? Oh, well, I've ordered some of that stuff that you mentioned. I've ordered that. That was not cheap. It was about forty quid a roll. But I've ordered one well, of those. I, it's it's worth it. You, with the polymaker stuff, you do get what you pay for. Yeah. Well, I think that because I've been using this wood filament for the longest time, and for a long time, I had a great you know a great run of results with it but i couldn't get it to stick down to the bed well enough on both my ender 3 pro and my uh, uh, cr10s um, but i've managed to crank that now because i really went to town with the um the leveling and i've i've been playing with the slicer settings and uh, i've got like you know you over extrude uh, a wider right. amount on the first layer and i cranked it up to 95 degrees celsius on the first three or four coats and then just cut it down and that that seemed to help as well uh, and dropping can you the adjust fan, those settings automatically with your slicer uh you can do it in the slicer yeah you can't modify anything on the printer itself whilst it's printing but yeah you can do it in the, in the slicer you can select what layer well, that's one of the things that lulls but the the with my taz you can adjust everything on the fly through the the menu panel on the printer. That's a really neat idea, I think. Which is, which is nice. That is nice. What slicer are you using? I, I Simplify forget. 3D. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I've got that as well, and I also use a Cura mm -hmm. specifically for the, the Lulzbot Taz, and I like them both. I think Simplify allows you to do a lot more tweaking mm -hmm. with the settings than the, than the Cura slicer does. Yeah. Yeah, I've only been using, but I get I get good results with both of them. Yeah, I think I think it's good to know both, and if you can afford Simplify 3D, I think it's worth having. But it is a case of you do have to dial in with and and play around, and you know you think you've got something perfectly right, but then you change the filament or something, and you know things all that can get thrown out. But I I, I really think changing the filament. I've got, I bought two new filament rolls, and one of them, the grey one, I can't remember what it's from. But I didn't get it from just Amazon this time. I actually hunted around and found some some good stuff, and um, it's 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 better. It's still not perfect, but it is noticeably better. Um, and I've had I've had some really good results. So um, good. Well, I'm eager they're... to see what hap what you think of the, the the Polymax. Yeah, and I've ordered some some spray adhesive, which I suspect is probably just like a, a, a hairspray. Let me see what it's called. Uh, 3D lac. That's what I've ordered. 3D lac. Uh, it's like a kind of a sounds solid. It's it, it had some very good ratings. I suspect it's probably just like a high end hairspray. <laughs> but I don't care because my corners are lifting, and I want the fucking thing to come off when I decide, not when it's halfway. I have that because uh, yeah, because some of this shit doesn't. No, and it, it, some of it, you know, you have to print it for four hours before you find out. I mean, you've done that three times in a day. It's demoralizing, but. You know, come back, yeah. bounce back. Because it's not supposed to lift. So there we go. Yeah. And then yesterday, I was doing, um, I was doing, a, 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 I was chipping in with the virtual tour of the Ivor Academy. They were doing that for their open day, which was fun. So my desktop oh. is covered with 
all the examples of things I wanted to grab and, and sort of hold up in front of the camera to show. So I've got cores and uh, various <laughs> things like this ear core and a bit of foam kicking around. <laughs> I think this is one I did a while back. Yeah. Yeah. So this is an old one. I just grabbed like a like a good example of everything I thought we might cover in the chat. Um, but there we go. So, uh, so this time we're chatting about cutting edges. Dun, da, da, da. An important part of mold making and an oftentimes fucked up portion of mold making. Yeah, I mean, well, cutting edges are one of those things. I The reason I thought cutting edges might be a good thing is because I've seen quite a few posts on Facebook of pieces that have it on there. And it's weird because I had a few emails asking about separating and floating pieces. And I think a lot of people have been doing things that they've seen done, but they don't know why they're done. So you'll see, you'll see people like separating and make up into like 12 pieces or whatever, because they've seen multiple overlapping pieces and they feel like they should do that too. And it's like, yeah, but that mm -hmm. would have worked as a one piece appliance or whatever. Do you, know, you don't have to inflict a process on something. I mean, I guess if you're just doing it to experiment, that's fair enough. No, but it's weird when people do things without knowing why it is done. And, yeah, there are reasons to do it, but there are reasons not to do yeah, it. Yeah, and so maybe we should hold off on the, 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 the multiple overlapping thing for another. That would make a really good episode, actually. Maybe we'll talk about that next time. But but, but this sure. one, I think, will stick with, with, with cutting edges and, and all that overflow. Uh, let's start off by, by explaining there, there may be some people listening who don't actually understand what the term means. Yeah. What, is, what is a cutting edge? Well, the way I think of it is, I mean, a lot of this stuff I think is is based on old school foam latex when you didn't have a barrier layer or anything like that. And what you would do is you'd have two molds. So you have your mold and your core and you put your foam latex into the mold and then you'd squish your core in and you'd have some kind of strap or a clamp or whatever to make sure it stayed pressed hard into the mold and then you'd bake it. So what you would actually have to do is ensure that the material that you didn't want or that you wanted to blend off to a feather edge was pressed hard enough into that mold uh, and gave you a nice fine edge. And obviously if the mold... Yeah, well, you're, all, you're always putting more than you need into the mold. So yes, you've got to, you're going to have excess coming out. Absolutely. And also the curious thing about foam is, unlike any of the other materials, is there was a, there was a minimum amount that you could put into a mixer in order for it to mix correctly. I think it was for us... When I started, my first job was as a foam runner. And the smallest amount that we could mix was, I think, the 150 gram base. Um, mm -hmm. And that would fill up like a, you know, like a Sunbee mixer type mixer. But the, it was like, it looked like a cup of liquid at the bottom at the start. But if you were going for a nice big high rise foam, you'd probably get half that bowl filled with foam. And you needed that much space. Oh, easily. So, so if, and if there was less liquid than that in the bowl, you couldn't be sure that the beaters would mix everything sufficiently so because with foam latex you were always going to mix way more than you needed because really the cost was in the time and trouble of mixing it rather than saving five grams of latex here or there because most of what was in that right. bowl was air anyway so um so because of the nature of the fact that you always had too much foam and you needed to get it in that mold before it gelled um there was always a case of often that there would be excess coming out so so I'll start with that just to be you know clear because with silicon you tend to try and get more accurate um, but basically yeah, the idea of a cutting edge was that you wanted to minimize the amount of mold that touches the core because if you're using a clamp or a strap or bolts or whatever to hold the mold and the core together the more of the face that touches the core the greater that amount of surface area that is is spread across that weight so if you imagine and it also increases the amount of suction yes that it's uh creating that's going to make separating the, the negative from the positive more difficult yeah. so you want a nice tight uh, uh edge and you want it to be able to like you say open up that mold without too much pressure so so the amount of cutting edge was basically with foam latex it was it was pretty close, but but the thing was you didn't have barrier with it like you do with silicone. So you didn't have to worry about mm -hmm. where the sculpt stops and then a bit of barrier and then the edge of the, appli the, edge of the appliance. You, you'd sculpt your piece and then you ended up with a little flashing bit. 
but there was always great pride when you opened the mold and the flashing would separate from the piece. Right. And that was a good thing, but you don't want that with silicone. So it's a slightly different thing. Yeah. So the cutting edge is created by the flashing that you put around the sculpture that creates a void for excess material to escape into or through. Yeah, it's where that mold actually literally physically cuts the foam off at the very edge. Um, yeah, it's where the positive and the negative actually come into contact with one another. So it does actually cut that foam. But the, the foam that it's cutting, when it does that cutting, is, you know, liquid foam. So it hasn't cured. It's not cutting it like a pair of scissors, but it's cutting it by virtue of the fact that a very, very thin amount of prescribed edge around the outside of your sculpt is... And because it's mold. mostly air, it'll it'll compress easier than silicone would because silicone is just a viscous liquid without hopefully without any air in it so silicone's not going to compress easily yeah. or, or as easily as as foam would yeah and but also it depends on whether or not you're doing it like when you put, put your material into the mold and then squish the core in or whether you assemble your mold and then inject the material as well because it has a slightly different process i think because if you have a, a mold that you sort of fill with material and then you squish your core into it you um you're going to then then tighten up your mold so you start with you know it's just sort of hand pressure or as much pressure as you can press in yourself and then you're going to use some mechanical d means to actually increase the pressure and closure so you're you you are physically forcing that mold to cram into the core whereas when you um are um injecting it into a mold the mold is already closed those edges are already together and so the foam or the silicon that you inject is going to go up to the edge and then stop. And it's not going to open anymore because the mold is already bolted closed. So you're sort of asking less of that edge if the mm -hmm. mold is already assembled when you introduce your caster material. I think that's how I sort of look at it. So in a way, I think you kind of need maybe a slightly bigger cut and edge if you're going to do that. Whereas when you're pushing the mold in closed, you kind of want as tight an edge as you can. But my recollection with foam was that we always used to use quite a tight cutting edge. A lot of pride in making that cutting edge as close to the edge as possible. Like yeah. two or three millimeters was was good. You know, you didn't want a lot. Yeah, it's it's what gives you that that beautiful blending edge. Yeah, which is is critical. So if the cutting edge is flawed somehow, your blending edge is also going to be flawed. Yeah. And if you if your mold or your core had warped, then you wouldn't get a complete closure. And you'd know that when you injected your foam, particularly when you injected your foam. This was something I, I, I remember distinctly, because you might have to use a lot of pressure to, 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 to fill that mold sufficiently. And if you saw the foam like pissing out of the, the overflow somewhere at one point, you could be quite sure that that meant that, that mold wasn't quite closing up enough. Do you know what I mean? You, you, you yeah. know, if you had a good edge, but there was no overflow, it didn't escape out into the overflow. It wasn't really a problem with foam, whereas it kind of is with silicone. So it's a different thing just because of the way you, you have to, you handle an appliance really. Cause foam's nice right. and light, isn't it? You can hold the nose of an appliance and the whole piece will kind of keep its shape because it's all springy and light. And because you need to keep that a little, little bit of flashing, uh, around the, the edge of, of a silicone piece, uh, if you're doing a, an injection or sometimes you don't have to inject silicone, you can just, it's got a long enough working time that you can just let it fill on its own and it'll, it'll, it'll rise to, mm -hmm. to the, to the level it needs to. You need to have a separate port for putting silicone into the flashing, especially if you're doing a, an encapsulated piece, because if you are injecting or letting it just fill on its own into a an already bolted closed mold you're not going to get that flashing mm -hmm. because it's going to stop at the cutting edge yeah so you need to be able to put some a little bit of excess material into a flashing area so you have that flashing to help keep the edge perfectly when you're manipulating the piece yeah. during application yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you know the um, there was a really good technique that 
I ascribe it to Alexander Wathy. I don't know if she came up with it, but it was a really neat one where she would, in, you know, inject the silicon into molds. And then exactly what you were saying, the silicon, because of the cutting edge was so good that the silicon didn't get out of the piece and into the flashing. So she would then mix up a separate batch with no deadener around the flashing area. So what it meant was right. you actually had a stiffer silicon for your flashing, which meant you could handle that and it would keep its shape a bit better, but that wasn't the appliance part that actually was stuck to the skin. And that was a really neat trick. I, I think like Vincent that. Van Dyke does that okay. too. Okay. Yep. That would make sense because they do a lot of cool shit. <laughs> <laughs> the definition of cool shit. Uh, yeah. So that's a really neat idea. Um, and, you know, seeing uh, like Sangi, have you seen he's got a really cool technique where he like uses glue gun around the edge of a flat? Yeah, you know, I, that's pretty of, cool. Instead of making yeah. it flashing, actually puts it on retrospectively which is really neat and that would be very stiff and hold the, you know the shape of the piece like a frame but getting ahead of ourselves um but yeah so yeah no sorry you go <laughs> where where do you want me to go <laughs> don't go come back sorry you look like you were about to speak and i cut in as usual i may have been i don't know i'm old i i forget where i'm going i'll stand up to do something and have no idea why i stood up <laughs> This may have been one of those times. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the purpose of a cutting edge is, like we say, is, is to physically separate the flashing from the piece, but also to ensure that you get a really tight edge. Because you, what you've got to remember is, obviously, what constitutes a crap edge doesn't take much. Like, the thickness of a piece of paper is way too thick. Because if you're, if you, mm -hmm. you can see that on the skin. So, so, so it's quite a critical thing that it closes tight. So having a good cutting edge is good. But I've noticed a lot of people with flat molds, um, putting their flashing a long way from the sculpt. But in addition to that, I think because of the way the sculpt is has been sculpted, you will end up with significantly more cutting edge because people press hard when they scrape. So what can happen is if you use a soft-ish silicone, yeah. like, for example, anything less than 30 Shore A, there's a chance that you, when you're scraping it, you'll end up with, you know, even though when you molded it, the piece had maybe a two or three millimeters between the edge of your sculpt and the starting of your flashing, you still end up with like 15 millimeters of, 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 of nothing but pure cat plastic before you get to the silicone, which begs the question, yep. why is that piece, why is yep. that mold so big? Because if that's, if, if, the, if the money shot bit that you actually need is much, much smaller, then you either need to scrape less hard or you need to um, make smaller molds the next time or sculpt it less. Because a lot of it, I think, is when people sculpt flat molds, they make them too thin for too long. And that wasn't an issue with a conventional mold, but it is an issue for flat molds because you get rid of your excess material by scraping it. And you don't do that with a normal mold. Yeah, and you don't have to... It doesn't, doesn't take much pressure to be too much when you're scraping. And sometimes even I, because I use um, Mold Star 30 for most of my flat molds, and depending on on the sculpt, sometimes a 30 shore is too soft. Well, something I guess you could do, <clears throat> and I haven't really done it myself, but it makes sense. I remember seeing, and I for the life of me, I can't remember who it was. So if you're hearing this and you know, then let us know. But somebody had a technique where they brushed on a few layers of silicone on a flat molded sculpt. And then they made like a rigid jacket on the top of that so that when you scraped it, you weren't scraping into an inch of silicone. It was only three or four millimeters of silicone, but it was an even coat over everything. And then that was sat in a, in a rigid jacket, either plaster or resin, which meant that you could turn your mold upside down, fill it, scrape it. And then when you want to apply it, if you want to apply it from the mold, you actually just pull out this thin skin of silicone that's loaded with the piece. Ah. So instead of it being a block of silicone, it was a contoured sheath of silicone um, that was sat in a customized jacket that held its shape, but you could remove that silicone plug. That's, yeah, that, that makes that makes total sense. Uh, I can see it. That the only problem with that I can see is how to get it perfectly level. So you've got Do your exactly, sculpts. Okay, all right. So, as soon as I said it, I, I realized, nope, you could just Yeah, you it, just brush your silicone exactly on and then let it set up and then you, you flood it with uh, with resin. 
Right, so and then you flood it with, yeah. And then no, that's a great need, idea. Whether you need keys in the silicone or not, I don't know, but... I'm going to try that. It's, it's a moot point, I think. It's it's pretty straightforward to, uh, to, to, to make that and try and see. But... um. But that's a neat idea. Yeah, but it, it's something I'm that could do it. reduce the compression effect of that on on cutting edges. I realize this is really fucking niche, deep dive shit that probably matters to about five people. But honestly, this is the kind of stuff that <laughs> keeps me up at night. That's the sort. That of stuff is a that good idea. So <laughs> I will talk about it. You, you. I'm not. I'm. This is not Joe Rogan. We're not trying to appeal to a lot of people. <laughs> We're not making a hundred grand an episode. No, it costs me about fifty quid an episode. <laughs> so, yeah, not quite the same thing. Uh, if I got to sit here and uh, advertise, you know, coffee or underwear or mattresses, um, but who's going to listen to that? Um, yeah, so that's something to be considered. What do you? How do you? We're talking about um, going back to positive and negative. Uh, pieces from mold what is your preferred method of closure do you stand on it do you uh do you bolt them no i was thinking about that uh i i'm i like bolts because i think we've done it so much for foam over the years the only issue with bolts is that you there's this spinning action involved, yeah. which has the potential of catching the cat plastic so over the last couple of years since doing that course that kazoo taught that i helped out on yeah i really like uh, straps um because well a couple of things one is you can have a nice curved mold that's contoured to the shape of the sculpt so it doesn't need to be a block as such which is the case with clamps mm -hmm. you need some kind of flat yeah you've got to have a flange a yeah you um uh, so, so clamps can work, but the trouble with the clamp is they exert a lot of pressure centrally if you can get it in the, in the center, but it also, you might not have a, a clamp big enough to get to the middle of the mold. And I'm, I'm cautious of using two or three clamps around the edge because I'm scared that one will be more pressed than the other and you end up with a sort of seesaw effect. Mm. So I think a good strap is probably the best result. And that's what I've been using most of the time. Uh, and the straps I've been using have been the ratchet straps yeah. rather than the ones that Kazu had, which was like a kind of a cantilever where you, I can't quite think what they call, but you put the, the thing in, it's like a cam and then you, you just pull the strap down once and then it's tight. Right. So you put as tight as you can and then you get a little extra with that thing. And that's probably all it needs. Cause I guess the danger of um, a ratchet strap is that you can way over tighten it. But um it's worked very, very well for me with, and especially if you use blocks of wood to, to, to between the mold and the strap, because it kind of, yeah. Yeah. Cause you bit. need to need to be cautious of too much torque in, in a, in a small area. I think yeah. the wood helps oh. even the force out across the surface. Yeah. That's physics folks. It does. But also the nature of the strap is such that it's, you've, you've got that strap that goes around the belly of the mold. And I guess you'd have more than one strap. But what I'm cautious of as well is that the, the strap is going to want to pull the mold together. Mm -hmm. So if you if you do it too tight, kind of crushing in as well as crushing down. But I guess that's why having uh, wood inserts in there to make sure it pulls in the right directions. It's a tricky one. It's one of those things I need to show somebody uh, rather than just, just words are not very good for describing how to use a strap with that. But I think straps are good. Weights I've never really gone for because they're, they're well, for a start, they're heavy. So, you know, if, if you're not using them, you've got to put them somewhere else. And so there's a, an inherent stress in, in putting mm -hmm. these weights on. And then, you know, if you don't put the weight centrally, you're... Yeah, you've got to make sure that the mold gets closed completely. Yeah, whereas a strap will provide the same exertion as a, as a weight, but without it actually being heavy. You know, you can probably get like, you know, a quarter of a ton or something out of a good ratchet strap without it, it weighing a quarter of a ton. Do you right. know what I mean? So... Well, I use I use bolts, I use straps, I'll use clamps, and I use weights. Uh, depends on the mold. I mean, I've got some epoxy molds that when I've done foam, where I've actually stood on the mold to get it completely closed, and then I'll clamp it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if your mold is strong enough and, and stable enough to be stood on, I don't think that's a bad thing at all. Um, and then it's, it's, it's just getting off without dismounting from it in such a way that you end up lifting one side, but... I guess if the if it's overfilled, it should be fine. 
Yeah. Well, the nice thing about foam is once once the once the mold with the foam in it's been closed, unlike silicone, it's not going to want yeah. to try to reopen again. And then once it's gelled, um, you know, you could feasibly unclamp, unbolt, you know, remove all of your closure uh, devices because once it's gelled, it's the foam's not going anywhere. With with your overflow, do you do? I mean, I always used to do this. I, I would I would skim the entire surface of whatever wasn't sculpted and whatever wasn't cutting edge. Everything else would be overflow, apart from your keys. Um, and I've seen more and more now that not being the case. I'm seeing more like sort of, um, you know, like like patterns of cut, of overflow. So you have a, quite a lot more contact with the core. Yeah, I, and I think that's more just uh, to save on the amount of excess material. Yeah, I, well, that would definitely save on material, but it also, I think maybe one of the things is the increased use of epoxy where the molds are very accurate. Because mm-hmm. if you had, a, I think one of the benefits of, a, of, a, of an overflow everywhere was that you minimize contact between the mold and the core. So if there was a little bit of warping, it wasn't so much of a problem. Whereas if more, of, like if 50% of the exposed, you know, flange or whatever is actually touching the core, then if there was a little bit of distortion, there's more places for it to touch it and keep it away. Mm-hmm. But actually, I think with epoxy, you get very little, a good epoxy, th- you tend to get very little in the way of warping. Yeah, I think contact between the positive and the negative is a good thing. You, uh, it, it certainly ensures that the mold is not going to rock. Mm. Uh, you know, if it, if you don't have a, many contact points, there could be a chance that the negative and the positive don't seat properly together. And there could be some play that's going to give you a shitty blending edge. Mm. It's nice when something just snuck, snaps together and there's absolutely no way that it's in the wrong place because it can only yeah. go together one way. Like having two keys at the top and one at the bottom and it's a really secure, you know. Uh, and a big key as well because, you know, when you when you fill it with silicone, you're putting your whole weight on it. You really want to make sure it's in the right place. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, one thing I do like about silicone with the with the open molds that you, you squish your core into is you can kind of put your silicone in and you kind of swill it inside mm-hmm. as well once it's poured so you know there's silicon on every surface on the inside so that when your core goes in even if it's slightly off it's hitting a lubricated silicone surface and kind of slides into place better than if you only half filled it and then s- s- slammed your core in yeah well that also helps ensure that you're not getting uh, little air pockets someplace that you're getting silicone in in potential trouble areas mm-hmm well, we got our um, air bubbles episode, which I've got to put out, um, and I've done some drawings for that, which show that whole kind of like you know when 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 the silicone doesn't quite fill, you know, and you end up with sort of voids, or worse still, it did yeah. fill, but then it leaked out afterwards. That's upsetting, um, and that comes down to your you know whether your cutting edge is touching down on your core, um, and I think that's the other thing is you know it's that the the margin for error is so slight, it really doesn't. An edge doesn't have to be that bad to be utterly fucking useless. And once you kind of get that in your head, then then you start sort of worrying about these things and then and paying attention to these things. And that's when, you know, perhaps a slightly more expensive mold material doesn't seem so bad because you know what the consequences of not doing that are. And they're, they're more expensive than the cost of the material. <laughs> you know, if yeah. you stay up all night for two nights to fix it, um, you'll pay the extra 20 quid or whatever to, to, to not have that happen. I think something else about cutting edges and flashing that we ought to mention is uh, the the flashing shouldn't be sharp right angles to the to the mold piece or to the to the sculpt. They they need to be softer edges. Yes. So that if you are able to have fill the mold for the for the piece and the flashing all together, or if you're doing doing um, a piece in a, in a flat mold and you're scraping it. If the the flashing is too sharp an angle, you're basically going to prevent them from coming out as one piece when you when you demold. Even if you are doing a an encapsulated piece that you've got cap plastic in there, it's going to that sharp angle is just going to slice it. And you can get that from um, from people who like use a, a sharp tool to to cut the angle and then leave a little burr of plastiline on there. And yep. then that ends up being a recess in the mold and then that's that locks into your cap plastic and um you know again it's one of those things where when you when you've 
and cried your eyes out because the piece is sticking to the mold trying to get it out um then you you learn pretty quickly that the 20 minutes it would have taken to smooth it out was was time well spent because you only make the mold one time but you might have to get 20 pieces out of that mold so, right you know if and they're all gonna gonna be fucked no and it costs the same amount of time and trouble really to make a shit mold as it does a good mold so if you're going to commit yourself to that material, you may as well make the best mold you can. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. Well, one of the things I tell tell my students um, when they're getting ready, because I see if we we talked about this with uh, the bad edges uh, discussion a while back, that I tell them that they should be able to close their eyes and run their finger over the edge of the sculpture and not be able to feel where the clay stops and the core begins. Yeah, that's a very good that's, point. That's when you know you've got a good blending edge. Yeah, that's very true. Because it's often the case, I think, when you sculpt it, that it's not enough like how the finished appliance will be that you might not notice the shift in angle visually, but like you say, you would feel it by touch. And yeah. It's, it's weird because when you're sculpting maybe in gray clay on a white plaster or whatever the color of the core is, um, you know, those differences can kind of throw you a bit. Whereas when you put the piece on in real life, it's skin color on skin color. So now the only, you know, the, the shift in angle between the piece and the, and the, and the skin uh, can be a lot more noticeable because it's the only thing that's different because they're the same color. So it's, right. it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a real swine when it happens. And it's amazing how, how little of a shift in angle is required. There are techniques though. You kind of scoop it in. Yep. But, no, it's, uh, it's, it's all nuanced. It's just like, just like looking for undercuts. You know, you've got to, if you, if you're going rigid to rigid with the mold and, you know, it doesn't take much for an undercut to completely lock up your mold, you know, half half a millimeter, as you know, will is enough to to lock a mold. Oh, so you've so got to look at look at your sculpt and your and your positive from every conceivable angle before you put your negative material onto it to make that mm -hmm. that other half of the mold. Or you may have just spent days working on a project that's going to be nothing but a very expensive doorstop yeah and that's a sad day we've all done it <laughs> yeah no yeah <laughs> more than uh, once i am ashamed to admit <laughs> and um like you were saying earlier about how uh the touchdown may be reduced to save on material um the overflow obviously there's a there's a there's a case to be made for making it too thick and too thin because obviously if it's too thin it doesn't easily allow the excess to squish out. And if right. it's too thick, then it'll easily squish out, but you'll end up using a lot more material because maybe mm -hmm. the amount of silicon that you have to put in that mold to fill it sufficiently, most of it's in the flashing. You know, and yeah, so you and, could and you, you need to be in... You, I've seen inconsistencies in the thickness of the flashing as well, mm. where it's you know maybe a, an eighth of an inch over most of it, and then it's maybe close to a half an inch in places. And that's going to be an area where stuff's going to tend to want to congregate and it, your flashing needs it needs to be a, an, an even thickness wherever you have it yeah and and as smooth as possible too because you don't want to have those if you're doing a an epoxy negative you know any any little little bumps or burrs in the clay are going to create potential tear hazards when yep. you go to remove your piece it may not be on the piece itself, but a tear anywhere could jeopardize the whole appliance. Yeah, because you want that to come out of the mold nice and easy. And so anything that yeah makes it snag or grip is, is not welcome. And it might just be the angles just of the piece are naturally such that they're going to cause undercuts in the silicone. So they're not mechanical undercuts in the sense that you can't open the mm -hmm. mold, but it might mean that some of the piece stays stuck in the mold and some of the piece stays stuck to the core and then if you're not careful you may damage it or at least stress it and if you've spent you know weeks and it's it's so funny you'll see this all the time with, with students where we sculpt something and like on day one you know we're doing the live cast it doesn't really mean much to them but by you know day 20 they spent they've invested they say a lot of time only 20 days but they've invested enough time in it now that if the piece comes out badly it really fucking matters to them because at this point they spend this much time on it and that's good, you know, to have that care. Well, 
Yeah, I equate that uh, to to like a degloving injury, where you've got maybe no undercut. You're creating an undercut because of the thickness of the silicone or the or the foam that it's wanting to stick to. It's getting jammed up against the part of the mold when you're pulling it out. It's like a degloving injury. Yes, where you're it's getting caught and it's especially just noted can can potentially tear the silicone when you're lifting it out of the mold. Uh, and that is a tricky thing to navigate. Yeah. Or or around corners corners of the jaw. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They get damaged by virtue of the shape. It isn't, isn't, and that, that's down to some clever mold making or flaring out the core in advance or breaking it down to separate pieces. And then you've got to weigh up whether the extra work is worth the hassle it saves you. It's always, it's always a trade-off, isn't it? In, uh, in mm -hmm. terms of time, expense, and trouble. But that's um, that's awesome. And sadly, sometimes you don't don't realize that it is a problem until you go to pull it out of the mold and it comes out badly, and you cast another one and it comes out just as bad, and you realize I have to do this whole thing all over yeah, again. That's not a nice feeling. Especially when you're when you're on a deadline with something. If you're if you're doing something for yourself, it's a, it's a shame you've you've wasted time and, and money on materials and getting it all done. But if you're doing this on a deadline for something where there isn't time to, yeah. to redo it, man, you're just screwed. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, I have a question. This may, this may seem a little bit um, mean, but I'm, I'm, it's coming from a good place. I've seen a few posts where people have asked advice about a job and the advice they are asking is pretty basic and I'm asking myself why did you take on a job and then after you've accepted the job then you go and ask how like you go ask on a forum how it's done because the the thing is if it's a specific thing or a difficult thing or like when you read it, you kind of go oh, I can understand why that's something you should know but if it's just a bog standard question like what is a mold or how do I stick an appliance on? I've taken on this job. My client wants me to do this, but I don't know how to do that. You kind of want to say, but should you have taken that on as a job? I mean, I guess it depends. Yeah, no, I've I've, I've seen that too. I've had people ask me questions. Um, I won't I won't say who, but I've had people ask me stuff that you should yes. know that where where you are where are you where you are in your in your in your career you shouldn't have to be asking me how to do that no i mean if you were in like the dentist and and the guy was googling stuff and you noticed he was looking up how do i do a filling halfway through your filling you probably wouldn't be inspired with confidence i realize that this is not medical <laughs> stuff we're doing but i'm just saying there's a certain sort of minimal expectation and it just it just it is odd to me that like i don't know i i would think twice about taking on a job if the things i didn't know included like not knowing what a mold was or how to work with plaster or something very basic. Yeah. It feels like maybe you should have just said no rather than say yes. Cause if you don't know that thing, what else don't you know that you really should know? Oh, I've gotten some job requests from people that for, for gigs, mold making gigs that I would love to do, but I've had to turn down just because I don't have the physical space to do what they need to have done. So I'll refer them to, to somebody yeah. else. Well, I've had jobs where somebody needed some extensive hair work. It's like, I don't, really do hair very well but i know people that do so i would point them that way or something do you know what i mean so so mm -hmm. the, there is value in being able to pass it on to the right person but i don't know i mean obviously we all need to work slightly outside of our comfort zone and stuff but you know how do you fly a plane is not something you want your pilot to ask whilst you're in turbulence do you know what i mean it's kind of like right. it seems like a very uh, that that seems like something that should be known if you're the sort of person taking on jobs i don't know but you don't know the nature of the job. It could be a very small thing. And I'm just asking the question, should should you take on a job if, if there's something that basic that you're not aware of? You know, it's not necessarily wrong to say no to that job and pass it on to somebody that... The, the person that's answering your question is probably the one that should be doing it. Agreed. Uh, anyway, I think we've got all that sorted. Uh, I just think... Oh, yeah. No, I just, yeah, I think we've... Just wanted to mention that, just to reiterate that thing about the barrier extending beyond the silicone, which is unique to silicone pieces. Because with foam, where you sculpted was where you wanted to sculpt, and then you'd have your cutting edge, and then that, you know, the piece would finish, and that would be your edge. Whereas when you have your cutting edge on a silicone piece, you get your you get a slight extension of silicone, which you need to bear in mind, because right. obviously the silicone needs to be 
within the encapsulant. So that it's not been a problem, but it's something you've got yeah, to bear in mind. Essentially, just got you have to take into account the volume of the how how the cap plastic front and back is going to affect the thickness of of the hmm. of the piece and therefore your your cutting well, because edge you've seen or blending um, edge obviously i mean it may seem like a, 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 a not a necessary thing but i think this this goes hand in hand with the observation we had about very very wide cutting edges because it it may not seem like a problem to have a lot of cat plastic but i think there is a problem with having too much cat plastic the problem is well one is the mold is clearly too big it's because if you think about how much how much bigger a mold needs to be if there's like you know half an inch of flashing it's like that's a lot of flashing your piece would be considerably smaller your right. mold would be considerably smaller because nothing looks more real like than real skin so if your piece is like five inches across and you know an inch of that is cat plastic either side then that's a lot that piece could be much smaller so you're going to be coloring a lot of skin to look like real skin that is already real skin I mean, there's no point in cutting your leg and then letting it heal so you can have a healed leg. If you don't want to have the injury, right. then the best thing to do is not injure it in the first place. So it's like, so if you if you, if you you want to have a piece that looks like real skin, then the smaller it is, unless you're going to do like a big sleeve thing, you know, the less the less fake, especially if it's like a hairy leg. Do you know what I mean? If you put a piece on a hairy leg and it's a dinner plate size appliance and you've got like a, a one inch stab wound, that's a lot of hair you've got to replace, you know, for the sake yeah. of it just being clumsily too big. So... So there's the, the, there's a case to be made for not making it too big. Well, it's also the matter of texture. Yes. Well, it might be the texture. The texture might be in the sculpt, but it probably won't show through the cat plastic because the cat plastic doesn't have any body to it. So it would just right, and it's and, and it's yeah. also unlikely that uh, I mean I know you will spatter some some clay uh, sl some clay slip onto the the cutting edge around the sculpt to give a little bit of texture to the cat plastic, but for the most part, you're not going to get any texture in the cat plastic that's over the, the cutting edge. Over and if it's, yeah. if it's too big, but, that's going to stand out because you've got texture everywhere else except in this little band around the, the appliance. And that's a bit of a giveaway for the thing, depending on the, on the skin and the, the texture of the skin but what's weird is it seems like well if the if the flashing is too big you can just melt it away and that's true you can but if you've got to melt off an inch worth of cat mm -hmm. plastic why the fuck is it there in the first place why not just have three millimeters or so of cat plastic flashing and then what i'll do is i separate the flashing from the cat plastic because i've seen a lot of people particularly makeup colleges or stuff when it's their first appliance or whatever and they're just dousing with a big brush a load of acetone and all they're doing is destroying all of the cat plastic that's not the point the point is to separate the flashing from your cat plastic edge with a tiny thin brush and it ev immediately evaporates away and then you're left with a nice beautiful thin edge it, it, you can't melt yourself a good edge it should have a good edge and the silicon is a courtesy to separate the flashing from the cat plastic it's not about having a crap edge and melting the fuck out of it till it's gone. Yeah, and once you've melted away the cap plastic at the edge of the appliance, then you've essentially fucked the appliance. Yeah, I mean, I've had... Uh, I try and make pieces where you almost don't need any solvent. It's thin enough that you could just press a brush down on it and just gently yeah. tug on the piece and it'll rip. Although some some cap plastic, they toughen over time. You know, a, a piece that's been left overnight would be... So yeah, well, I think I, I think that's particularly true of the acetone soluble cat plastics. Like um, Glatson um, seems to get tougher with age. Well, they make those you know tougher ball caps yeah. out of it. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I've done a great time with Glatson. I did try it for a few things just to experiment, but I I still think Bullies is the yep. winner. All that really cool stuff that motion picture effects have. That, yeah, that's good. But um, Super Bullies is good, but I. Still like my acetone cat plastic, or a combination of the two. Spray a couple of layers of the uh, the IPA cat plastic, let that dry, then the acetone one to back it up. That works quite well. But uh, yeah, you don't need a big piece of cat plastic, particularly if you've got a piece like around the eye or something where you know, say you've got an appliance over the top eyelid, so you've got to go between the bottom of the eyebrow and the eyelashes of the top lid. That's a very very small mm -hmm. distance, 
And so you can't just throw away five or six millimeters here or there of cat plastic. Do you know what I mean? You've got to be very tight with it. So I, I tend to be quite prescriptive about that, very tight with my cat plastic bear. I like it to be maybe three mil between the edge of the sculpt and the cat plastic stopping. That, that seems plenty to me. Um, I don't see why it needs to be more than that. Because like I say, if you've got to melt it off, A, you're going to be putting a lot of acetone on to take it off. If you don't take it off, it means you're going to have a lot of wrinkling around the outside of the piece. It extends way beyond the size of the piece. That's unnecessary. And also, uh, there's a danger. If you can't see where your silicon starts, you might go through that catalytic to where the silicon begins. And then over time, that edge is going to get worse and worse. So to have a very diff definitive stopping point where the cat plastic stops and then with a tiny brush separate that out so you remove the cutting edge so you remove the overflow without having to douse it uh that would work really well it works well for me no um, no it makes it makes, it makes me perfect sense see people with a with a q-tip and gallons of acetone trying to make it off because then you, you're putting loads of acetone on and that that again is not good yeah i you i know? think uh you know anything I mean, three millimeters might be a little bit pushing pushing my luck with with three millimeters, but um, I think you I don't think you want to go any more than five. No, I don't think so. You know, and a, and a centimeter is so. like a mile. Well, it just means it's proportionally the mold is much bigger. I mean, well, for flat mold, I mean, obviously on a face mold, it's on a core and everything, that's not such a big deal, and you might get good results with it actually. You know, I've seen people with bigger with bigger flashing areas and they've had good results, but I'm still drawn towards trying to make it as tight as I can get away. Well, I with. think that that picture um, that I just sent you before we started recording of the piece that Rob Friedis was making a mold of. Yeah. And he was putting yeah, the putting really the nice. flashing for the cutting edge down on that. I think that cutting edge separation from the sculpt to the to the flashing is maybe five millimeters. Mm hmm. Really nice, nice yeah. and clean, and it mimics the shape of the sculpt. It it follows the edge of the sculpt very closely, yeah. and that, I think that's important as well. I do because then it's got a, it's a nice consistent, um, you know, thickness. Of the yeah, because I've I've yeah, seen so I've seen up. molds from um, student molds where it'll be maybe five millimeters for part of part of the way around, and then it'll be two centimeters, and then it'll be down to a centimeter, and it's it's yeah. not a consistent distance from the sculpture and that i think that's well, that, also something that that has to has to be done properly yeah i think so well again it's one of those things where it often happens when it's the first time they've done something because they they haven't looked at a makeup where they cut all these corners and then going oh that looks crap and it looks crap because of the things i did quickly in a hurry which it's still a three week job. So I could have spent those three weeks doing a good job, but instead I've done a shit job. So because I've cut corners, I have a, a less than I would like result. But the time it took me to do that shit job is the same. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So it's like, it, it doesn't take that much longer to do it properly. And actually you only need to do it badly once really, and then reflect on what you did wrong, which is why I'm so keen on taking pictures at every stage. Because when we look at the finished thing and there's a problem, and there's always something you could improve. Yeah, it's, on. A, it's akin you to the measure, look back measure twice, cut once uh, mindset. Do it, yeah. what, do it, do it well the first time, so you don't have to do it a second time and yeah. have it take so much longer. Sure, but you know, you, I think it's important to kind of fuck it up. See, here's well, it's part of the thing, learning right? process. It is part of the learning process, but if you pay to do a course and you make some major, I say major, you know, you're not, you know driving over someone's head but if you if you make some mistakes such that the piece is noticeably worse than you would like and you think you know i'm really not happy with the finished result you have actually learned a lot but the truth is there's a good chance you're gonna depending on how you're psychologically made up there's a good chance you go shit i had three weeks or whatever to do this and it's not as good as i would like so therefore i feel like i've wasted my time when do you know what i mean so mm -hmm. there's a there's a pressure on you to kind of perform but at the same time a lot of the people need to and myself included i need to do things wrong a few times to really like cement in my head why i need to do it the right way i'm stubborn i'll never read the instructions i'll go in there pig-headed i'll screw things up but out of that will come like a realization and so it's, it's it is good to make mistakes but it's 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 hard to 
to real and i think the thing about a course is you you do something once or you know what i mean you're there for as short as time as as they can because obviously courses cost money tutors cost money so they want to you know make it five times as long as it needs to be so if you end up doing something just one time it may not be the best time that you're going to do that do you know right what I mean? <laughs> so but you you will get a lot out of it so you need to come at it from the kind of very open-minded frame of mind that you know you're going to do things wrong and make mistakes but at the same time you're going to know how not to do it plus you've got a class of other people with you who also maybe made their own mistakes who weren't your mistakes so you get to see 12 people's mistakes or 10 people's mistakes or whatever and that's quite good because it means you really get to see what can go wrong and then the next time you do it you have like a newfound respect for the time it takes to put that curtain edge on because you realize why you do that that way you know, just because when you were saying like you've seen inconsistent thicknesses and all that kind of stuff, a lot of that's just people being sloppy because they want to get it done in a hurry. Because at that time, the the the, the nerdiness of doing and it, nobody and nobody ever told them any differently. No, well, you can you can tell people, but at the same time, if they're in a hurry or they're going out or they don't see why they should do this, you know, then it just feels like. A burden that you'd rather not put up with but then when you reap the fruits of that later when your piece is stuck in the mold or you know it rips every time you get it out then you go oh i get it now that's what i'm saying you take pictures every step because if something happens as a direct consequence of a thing you did or a thing you didn't do that you should have done you can point to that and go right this is sticking because of that burr where you cut and you didn't smooth it out because you didn't want to do that or you didn't know or you weren't whatever do you know what i mean the the point is i'm not shaming anyone i'm just saying it happened because of the thing you did and it's your fault that is the result yeah. so the next time you do it don't do it it happens to it happens to everybody at some point absolutely it does and i think that's why you've got to do it again and i think that's why it's very important to to teach in a way where you teach things that can be repeated so that someone can go away and do it again which is why it's nice when they leave a workshop where they've got you know, cores that they've made that can be reused again and again and again because that way they can do it again. Because if they don't practice, it just stagnates and and you don't know, maintain that information. Have you ever demoed a a project and done it intentionally wrong to show students how doing something? It doesn't have to be a major fuck up to completely screw screw the pooch. No, I haven't. But that sounds like a really good idea. Yeah, that just just occurred to me that because I've I've had teaching moments where I'm doing doing a demo and stuff goes wrong and you have to oh here's a good teaching moment you know this this wasn't supposed to happen but it did and here's how to how to fix that oh I've definitely fucked things up in demos without meaning to I just mean I haven't deliberately done it no but to do something intentionally intentionally wrong to show them how how bad something seemingly small. Yeah can be like like an undercut that you missed that locks up a mold no i've only done that once intentionally for an article for prosthetics magazine which i never put together i need to dig those pictures out i'll, I'll make a blog post out of them where i deliberately sculpted a nose and molded it in plaster knowing that there would be undercuts i did do that once I for just, an article but i haven't i haven't done it you for just, a class you just reminded me of an idea I'll, I'll, i want to talk to you about when we're when we're okay. done but um but yeah, no, I haven't done that, but that makes a lot of sense. I've definitely screwed things up without meaning to. And I, although I, I let the wave of shame hit me first, and then I will say, <laughs> now I screwed up. Because the thing is, when I have been at places where I've been learning and somebody screws something up and they say they screwed up, there's not one part of me that's gleeful about that. So I don't mind admitting that I screwed something up because I know that once I've explained it, it'll be obvious as to why I did that. And often it, you can screw things up because you may have multiple things going on at once and maybe you mix something up or you've got something wrong in your head because, oh no, sorry, that was your thing and or you weren't paying attention. I've done that where I poured out a silicone then something happened and I wasn't sure whether that was the B or the A I poured on that kind of thing. Or do you know what I mean? So I have definitely yeah, done that. Yeah. And then I was like, oh shit, I screwed up like this. But no, I haven't actually deliberately screwed something up for a class. But that's a good idea, actually. I like that. Yeah, I've, I've had students uh, break their molds trying to demold stuff. And I just, you know, having been there myself, you know, it's, I just f feel so bad for them because yep. they've, done a beautiful sculpture and 
they're so pleased with the piece and they can't get the mold apart. Yeah, it's very hard. To, and it's to it's, hear that, it's to just hear that. it's so demoralizing. Yeah, no, I know that feeling. <laughs> no, I know that feeling. Yeah, that kind of sinking feeling. You just have to wash over you like a wave, and then kind of come back for more. Uh, it, it, it is a tough one, but you know, it's it, weathering those emotions is a big part of anything because I think being competent comes at the cost of multiple errors and recovering from those errors. Um, and it's, it, yeah, that's why, like I say, when I have screwed up stuff, I'm quite happy to say, Oh, I fucked this up and I'll explain yeah, why no, I fucked you, this up. You, you gotta, and, yeah, you gotta yeah, own it. Most of the time people are like, Oh, I can see how you, that happened. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, people make mistakes um and and there's nothing wrong with it there is something wrong with admitting uh, sorry not admitting it and then refusing to correct it that is a problem because then that's 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 not a good indication for how things are going to pan out but um but uh, yeah most of the things i've learned have been from you know things that have gone wrong um sometimes they're not big deals you can kind of get away mm -hmm. with them you can punt you know you can fudge it and fill an edge or whatever but you, you go away going shit that is not happening again i need to make sure that i'm you know aware of this well, i think that's the only way learning takes place if you know if you if you never make any mistakes you never get any better well that's the thing i'll say is you know the, the mistakes i've made you haven't been around to see but that doesn't mean i haven't made them and i've probably made a lot more than you have trust me yeah and don't, and don't like to broadcast them no. but and also that's the other thing they, they happen to everybody is i kind of think look, look if i can do this if i can figure this out trust me you can too because i ain't that clever it's just purely an interest <laughs> and an ability to recover from errors is far more important than being clever because i am not clever so. yeah well well i like i like i i frequently have said in our prosthetics magazine tutorials if todd can do it anybody can <laughs> there you go Right, I think we waffled on. That's uh, over an hour, and I didn't mean it to be that way. But um, that is how this works. Um, yeah, we start. We we got all of our cutting edge topics in, and then some. Yeah, we have. So what I'm going to do is I'll put together quite a lot of photos for this one. I think I may do another little handout for it because this this needs pictures to explain a lot of what this is. So definitely, uh, there will be a handout for this. So when you're um, listening to this be, be sure to check out the show notes i realize a lot of people go to what the fuck do you mean by show notes what i mean is in the podcast depending on where you're listening to this if you're listening to this on the website then there'll be a link underneath it where you click on it and you'll be able to download it it'll be a pdf if you're listening to it in something like uh, apple podcasts or spotify or something there should be a link that takes you to this blog post page that has that download or it might be a link in there because it's weird because some podcast uh, applications permit links in the description and some don't so i may put a link in it but it might not be functional which is why i always mention where the um the actual blog post is so you can go to that to get it but um yeah. The best way to listen is, of, of course, to go to our website, battleswithbitsofrubber.com, where you can listen to all of our podcasts, get all the show notes, and leave us a voice message. That would be nice. Yeah, we like voice messages. We've got a few good ones, actually. Um, we've got to get back in touch with a few people. I've had some really nice messages, and I've had quite a busy week, and I haven't responded to the people that did, so thank you for those that did. Uh, we will get those on the show on the next one. I might put one on, on this one. I'll go, t I'll go take a look at them. Yeah, they're very cool. Uh, so there's that. And you can obviously email us, stuartandtodd at gmail.com with your questions. And then if you're happy, we'll, you know, we'll mention your name and throw this into and It can be the subject of a, po a podcast episode. I mean, honestly, I care about and you're the same we just care about the craft of how stuff is made and we waffle on about all that kind of stuff so even if it seems like it's not a grand significant you know massive thing it doesn't matter it's the it's it's all of it we hope to do this a lot so the you know anything to do with prosthetics and making any difficulty any that's why this podcast is called battles with bits of rubber it's specifically about the difficulties involved in that sometimes we interview people sometimes we just talk shit about stuff ourselves and you know but we love it we we do it because we can't not do yeah, it yeah man it's in our it's in our blood and i'm aware that i'm pretty slack on the editing and haven't been uploading like every week so i know a lot of podcasts are like weekly and i try and do that but honestly it's just us 
<laughs> in between everything else and with the kids being off school homeschooling doing jobs and stuff it's not a full-time job i can't just pay someone to edit this and all you know all that kind of stuff so I, we do them when we can but i think that means that when they come out they're worth listening to rather than being committed to a you know brutal schedule where we just have to pump any old shit out yeah, we hope we're going to do something yeah. We hope people are listening. Well, we hope yeah, you will nice tell other people to, to listen because we're not doing this just because we like to hear ourselves talk, though that is true. <laughs> Do you like the sound of your voice? I've gotten used to it. Let's, let's put it that way. I don't like the sound of my voice. And the thing is, I have to edit these things, so I know very well what I sound like. Which begs the question, why do I talk so much? And it's probably because I like to say things, but I don't like to listen back to them. You are a wealth of information, Stu. Oh, I just fucking waffle on. But thank you. That's kind. I like it. I like it. I like listening to your sexy English accent. Will you say that? Is English an accent? Well, not to you. All right, I'm going to shut up. Let's go. Thank you very much for listening. Please tell one other person about this podcast if you like this. It means a lot to us. The best thing anyone can do if they really like this is share this with one other person. You know, if we get a thousand people that listen to this and a thousand people tell another thousand people, that's a lot of people. So that would be nice. Anyway, I'll shut up now. Thank you very much. There you go. Cheers, Todd. Cheers, Stu. Take care, man. Okay. Talk to you soon. You can get in touch through our Facebook page or email us at stuartandtodd at gmail.com. Check the show notes for more information. If you enjoyed this episode, Tell someone else and help us grow by sharing it on social media. Thanks for listening.